Good evening. On August 14, 2007, I was released from prison after serving over 37 and a half years in 17 prisons across the state of New York. And the reason I served 37 and a half years is that I was involved in a robbery in which I helped kill three people. Shortly after my arrest, this is a picture that was taken of me two hours after I was arrested for being involved in that robbery in which three people died. As you look at this picture, you see an angry, bitter, mean, hateful person. In order for you to understand how I became this person, I have to take you back in time. My mother was an extremely beautiful woman, but she was also an alcoholic. Whenever my mother drank, she would go to a bar. Whoever bought her the most drinks could take her home and do whatever they wanted to do with her. At the time of my birth, she had no idea who my father was. She ended up having six children with five different men. And since at the time of my birth she had no idea who my father was, she left me in the hospital. I ended up going to Our Lady of Victory Infant Home for Children, and from there I went to a succession of foster homes, orphanages, detention centers, and reform schools. By the time I was 16 years old, I had already been arrested 15 times. The first time that I ended up on East Ferry Juvenile Center was at the age of eight. And when I entered the juvenile center at the age of eight, they made me sit down with a psychiatrist. And during an interview, they asked me to count to 10, and they asked me to do my ABCs. And since I didn't know how to do my ABCs and count to 10, they diagnosed me as being mentally retarded. Every time I got rearrested and I got put in this juvenile center, everybody felt that they had to put a new diagnosis on me. So everything that somebody could possibly be called schizoid or antisocial personality, personality, all these different disorders. And whereas some people may reject those labels, I embraced them. I loved being a retard. I loved being a hoodlum. I loved being all these negatives. And basically, why I says I had to live up to those things. If I went to school and the teacher says, all of you guys handed in your homework, my teacher would point to me and say, Jerry, where's your homework? I would say, don't ask me where my homework is because I don't do homework because I'm a retard. And then eventually I started acting like a retard and doing all these things. And for those of us who are a little bit older, back in the day, bless you, back in the day when we did something wrong, they would send us to the principal's office or do something like that. And every time I went to the principal's office or when I was in reform school or the orphanages and that, people felt that they had a right to beat me. I literally received thousands, or not thousands, but hundreds of beatings as a child by nuns, priests, counselors, teachers, foster parents, and all these different people. And I remember as I was growing up and when they used to beat me, I used to say someday I'm going to become big and strong enough where nobody's ever going to put their hands on me ever again. And eventually what I did is I joined a gang called the Savage Ones. And this was me and I flocked around a bunch of people just like me. No educations, people who had blamed society and blamed everybody else for everything that ever happened to us. And when I joined the Savage Ones, it was like I found my family. And it was like the best thing that ever happened to me when I did that. After my arrest, I was in county jail in 10 Delaware. They tried to reinstitute the death penalty in me. They tried to do everything that they could to reinstitute the death penalty. But since they couldn't do it, what they did do is after I went to trial, I was given 50 years to life with a recommendation that I never be released on parole. I ended up going to Attica, and, and, and I became worse in prison than I was actually out here in the free world. I got involved in gambling, loan sharking, extortion, drug dealing. And before I went upstate, I made a promise, because when I went to prison, they were extremely violent in there. And I made a promise to myself and to others that nobody would ever put in their hands on me as they had done to me as a child. All the scars that you see on my head and all over my body, none of them came from when I was in prison. In prison, you learn to adapt to your surroundings. 
I thrived in, in Attica. And I remember the first day when I went to Attica and I went out in the yard and there were over 500 people in that yard and I knew over 200 of them. And they were all the people who had grown up in the system with me. They had started out in foster care and orphanages and detention centers and reform schools and they had graduated to prison. And what I learned is that once you become a product of the system, you're usually a product of the system for the rest of your lives. And, and I got involved in all these criminal activities and then they started sending me to all these prisons thinking that somebody was going to kill me. But nobody killed me. I wouldn't let nobody kill me. So, and I went to the yard every day and I was involved in all this stuff. And eventually, in 1987, they built a new prison called Shawangong Correctional Facility. State of the art, Maxi Max Prison. And I was sent there and I remember getting there. And it was like almost like that first day I went to Attica. There were 64 people. And in 1987, I was given the honor and the distinction of being one of the 64 most dangerous and disruptive people in the New York State criminal justice system. And to me, that was an honor. When I was nine years old, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I told a counselor, I said, the only thing I want to be when I grow up is a killer and a gangster. I went to prison as a killer, and while in there, I became a gangster. And I became good at it. I, I found myself doing criminal activity. I was a better criminal in prison than I was out here. So what happened is they sent me to this prison, and I get there late at night, and, and it was all convicted murderers. There were 64 of us convicted murderers. And I remember walking to my cell, and as soon as I get to the cell, I knew about 50 of them in there, because I had been with them in many different prisons. And, I, and, I, and I'm, as soon as I get to the block, I come up to the cell, I want to say hello to everybody. And all of a sudden, one of the guys goes, and he, he puts his hands to his mouth, and he tells me to look up. And I realized when I looked up, I had been in all these different prisons, and one prison is really much the same as the other, but this, the difference with this prison is that it had a camera looking at me. I was under 24-hour a day monitoring and supervision. If I used the bathroom, if I took a shower, if I had a conversation with the person in the cell with, next to me, it was being monitored. The next day, we come out in a room like this, captain comes in there with his crew, he says, listen, as far as I'm concerned, every one of you guys is a piece of crap. And we really don't care what you do to one another while you're in here. You can do whatever you want to do. But we're telling you that if you mess up in this program here, you, the only place you go from here is to spend the rest of your life in solitary confinement. I had already spent over nine years of my life in solitary confinement. I knew what it was about. So he put us in this room and he says, there's 64 of us, talk about peer pressure, all convicted murderers. And he says, all right, you guys will be given the opportunity to work your way out of this block. And the only way you're gonna work your way out of this block is you have to start taking educational and therapeutic programs. And I'm sitting there, I didn't wanna take no programs. I had a second grade education at the age of 37. I still believed that I was a retard. I had become everything I wanted. I didn't want no schooling. I didn't want nothing. I had become exactly what I always wanted to be. So I'm sitting there, and he says, all right, by a show of hands, if you want to work your way out of this block, who's going to sign up for school? And I'm looking around the room. I'm hoping somebody would raise their hand, and nobody would raise their hand. So I said, man, I raised my hand. And man, you talk about the, the, the vibes in there. And Jerry, everybody said, Jerry, what's up with that? I said, don't worry about what's up with me, because first of all, nobody was going to try me. But the thing is, I told him, I'm not staying here. I'm a criminal. I wanted to go back to Attica or Sing Sing or one of these other places to continue my criminal activities. So two other guys raised their hands. I ended up signing up for school. A couple months later, they let me go for my GED, and I passed it. Back in the, back in the 90s and the 80s, they had college programs in prison. They eliminated college programs in prison for the number one reason they did it is what they discovered is that many people who were getting educated in prison, they weren't coming back. The recidivism rate for anybody getting a college degree in prison was less than 3%. Whereas right now, somebody getting out of prison, he's going back, he or she is going back with a 66% or higher. So what happened is that I still believe this retired thing that I had always told I After I got my GED, I went in front of this committee. I said, listen, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm rehabilitated now. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing all this other stuff. And they said, oh, wait a minute. 17 years of being a jerk and doing all these other things. You've got to come with more than this. 
So there really wasn't that many programs there. I said, well, let me go down there, sign up for college, make them believe that I'm really buying into this crap that they're trying to force on me. So I go down there, and you know what I discovered at the age of 37? I discovered I never ever was mentally retarded. I wouldn't have any of those clinical diagnoses that I had basically bragged about being all my life. And what they did find out is that I was a borderline genius. And you know what? Many years, many, many years and many prisons later, I stand before you today with two master's degrees. One in urban ministry and the other one in healthcare administration. My undergraduate degrees are in psychology and sociology with a minor in criminology. I came to understand why I became that person in that picture. But more than anything, I learned to take accountability for my own self. See, prisons and rehabs and all these other places get you so used to playing the blame game. Don't you know that I used to blame my victims? They wasn't supposed to be home that night. They were supposed to be in Florida. So I said if they would have went to Florida, I wouldn't have killed them. And that guy that came down to the street to investigate what the noise was about, I said he should have minded his own business. And I blamed the judge who sentenced me and the DA who prosecuted me. And I blamed my mother and I blamed everybody else. I remember one night going to the college program. I go back to my cell, I'm sitting on my bed. I says, is it possible that a person like Jerry Ballone could become something other than what I had become? See, I never even thought of being anything other than a criminal. I loved being a criminal. I thought it was basically all I thought that I could ever be. And just by me planting that seed in my mind that night while I was sitting in my cell, it was, at a, it, it was the turning point of my life. Also, my original sentence was 50 years to life. I was told that I had to do 50 years before I become eligible for parole. You talk about a ministry and somebody being led by the Spirit. One night, guard comes by, puts a letter on my bars, I open it up. Some law had come out. I had already threw all my legal papers away in prison. Sometimes you can lock in a cell where you can actually look out at the free world. I made sure that I never ever had a cell that looked out here in the free world. This world no longer existed for me. So imagine the day that I get a letter telling me that 25 years had been knocked off my sentence. So instead of becoming eligible for parole in 2020, I became eligible for parole in 1995. But those of you who are politically aware know that George Pataki got elected that year too. So while he was in office in, in, in New York State, you go to the parole board, they hit you two years. He was in office for 12 years. Every time I went to the parole board, I was hit with two years. 2007, Elliot Spitzer came into office. Didn't hang around too long because they had a problem with some ladies. <laughs> but, but during his administration, he used to be the former attorney general of the state of New York. And as the former attorney general, he had to follow Pataki's directives. But what he discovered during his administration as the Attorney General is that there were many people in prison who were no longer the people that they were at the times of their convictions. And what they did, they had, many of them had done what I did. They had obtained an education, they took all types of therapeutic programs. Not only did they take them, I became a professor. I took all kinds of therapeutic programs not only took them, but became a facilitator and did a lot of other things in that area. And I started giving back. And, and, and I've just been blessed in so many ways. And um, since my release, I spend most of my time going around speaking in schools, churches, colleges, prisons, not telling people what to do, because they're going to do what they want to do anyway. I just try to make them aware that the decisions they make have severe consequences. Thank you very much.